podcast. This is Rob Thompson here, as you know, your host with the most. I don't even know, Tony, I don't even know why I said that. That was just ridiculous. And I'm not going to edit it. So we're keeping it. <laughs> that was like, like something Richie Cunningham would say if he ever had a podcast. It's the host with, you've got enough. You've got equipment and you've got some stuff. So let's go that direction. I do. It's like someone was like, Rob, you need to put like signage back here. I'm like, I'm in a, I'm in a radio station studio. I think the equipment speaks for itself. You speak for yourself as well. Thank you. Tony Schiller, how are you, buddy? Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. It's great to connect with you. Um, so, uh, um, you know, you're one of those guys that have, has been eluding me for a number of years to be on my podcast show, and, and you're definitely a influencer in the industry. And um, I, I've always had your name on my list. There's a lot of good, there's Gary Vanderchuk. There's a ton of on that list and you're, you were on that list. So um, I'm really thrilled that, you know, you're, you're able to spend some time with us. So, um, you know, let's just jump right into it. Fantastic. So let's talk about this. Let's, let's talk about your career. Um, and I want to talk about your career a little bit, how you got to this point. Um, and maybe you can answer this right off the top were you an entrepreneur earlier on or is this something that happened to you by default of owning your own business? Well, I, I've been in the sports entertainment industry my entire career. And for the first 10 years, I worked for other people and I worked for other people that had a lot of money. Yep. And uh, I had an epiphany one day thinking I work for billionaires and I'm slaving away, putting in 90, 100, 100 plus hours a week and really achieving great things, but it really doesn't matter to them. No. Why would I do it for them when I could do it for myself and others? So that, that, that was an important juncture in, in my career path. When, when you were in high school and even before, were, would you consider yourself, were you the guy who hustled newspapers and you know, hustle the kids with, with candy and, you know, the cake parties, or was this something that was a whole new venture? I started working in seventh grade, and from seventh grade on, I always had jobs. And one of the, one of the ongoing jokes with, with my family, my wife and my two daughters, is almost every time we're together, I'll talk about one of my summer jobs, one of my part-time jobs, and they're like, how many jobs did you have? <laughs> I mean, literally... I was a lifeguard. I, I did streets and san sanitation work. I worked for a florist. I worked for a caterer. I, I was a vendor at Wrigley Field. I could go on and on for this entire podcast talking about the 77 part-time jobs I had in middle school, high school, and college. But I always felt the need to be doing things, to meeting people, and putting money in my pocket. So let's talk about um, let's talk about the sports industry and. You know, you as a, one of the founders and an executive vice president, a partner of Paragon uh, Marketing Group, which, I mean, we could, I want to spend some time on this because it's fascinating. You guys, I mean, been known in the marketplace as the ones you're to go to go through for, for Gatorade and have been for a very long time. And um, could you talk about that and what the core of your, your business is and how you've seen it change from the time you guys started 20 plus, 23 years ago? Well, the way we started is an interesting story, and I'm going to start way back, and, and, and I'll build to your question, Rob, because it's an important question. I was scheduled to have lunch with a, a buddy of mine. At the time, I, I was vice president of corporate marketing for the Chicago Wolves, a minor league hockey franchise in Chicago, and I was having lunch with a buddy of mine, a fellow named David Brenner, and David at the time was the director of partnerships for the Chicago Bulls. And I walk into David's office at the United Center, and I give him the, the head nod, hey, what's up, dude? And he gives me the same head, head nod dude back and throws a piece of paper across his desk. And he says, this is what's up. And I'm like, what is it? And he said, I just resigned. And I said, you're leaving the Chicago Bulls. And for a point of reference, David had just received his, his fourth ring and the Bulls were new tenants at the United Center. And everyone is expecting that the Bulls were going to receive their fifth ring in a, in a short time. So I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And, and David said, I'm sick of the grind. Uh, I'm sick of all of the traveling and, and the games and just the season never ends. And then there's another season upon you. 
he said to me two very profound things that really have been foundation of, of our agency from day one, which is, he said, I want to make more money. I want to have a better quality of life. And I want to create an agency where everyone has that same opportunity. And we now have 90 plus employees. Wow. And from top to bottom, if you want to leave work early to go coach your kid's softball team, or if you want to leave work early because you, you're going to the Cubs game that day, all of that is your decision as long as you're accountable to your teammates and our clients. So, you know, we challenge and empower our employees. If you know that you're going to fill in the blank, go coach your kid's game or go to the Cubs game or hit it hard tonight and be hungover tomorrow morning and not show up until 10 o'clock, get your work done proactively. That's, that's what we, we ask. So our, our culture is really one of our driving forces of our business. And our culture is all about being a good partner. And part of what I just talked about is being a good partner to each other, to our clients, to the marketplace. So we've always employed a, a ser service orientation. We, we, we're always making sure that we provide much more value than expected. And when we first started working with Gatorade, it was almost a fluke how we got in there. The director of marketing at the time at Gatorade was a former employee of, of David's when David was at the Bulls. And these two were talking and, and this fellow said he was looking for an agency. And David said, well, why don't you talk to us? And he said, you're too small. You guys couldn't handle it. And we wound up winning an RFP and the relationship uh, was a very small test project. And they told us years later, the reason why they, one of the driving reasons why they hired us is we all walked in with a 16 ounce Gatorade bottle. We, we, we showed we were, we were believers. Oh, that's that. awesome. So, but to answer your, your, your question, um, we feel like it, it's incumbent upon us as an agency to think of things our clients don't think of, to do the things that they're not capable of doing because they don't have the resources, the time, the experience, the expertise. And sometimes that's really big things, moving mountains. It's not, sometimes it's, it's cleaning out the attic and cleaning out the garage. Nothing is too big or too small as long as, as we can help our client be successful and, and measure that and help them articulate that. Let, let's go back to what you said before about building a culture. And I think that's so important. Was it was it built upon, especially with startups, because it's so hard, because if you've never done it before, you're looking at what other people have done. You know, you're looking at the entrepreneurial magazines and what's happening in the social media. How was it, was the core of your, your culture, was it built upon your experience working for other people, like your partner said, was because you just didn't want to have that same experience that you were going through. And you knew as as kind of experiencing that part of it, that, that basically said, I want to make more money. I want better quality of life. Was it being mindful and having self-awareness that helped you guys um, create that culture? Well, we, we were very mindful of trying to create the culture as we were building the business. And it's something that we're still very mindful of today. We, we, we put a tremendous amount of time into our culture. And we, we knew what we wanted to be to our clients and to the marketplace. Therefore, we, we knew what we wanted from ourselves, from our team. We wanted to hire people that were passionate, passionate not only about our industry, but also passionate about life. We wanted people that wanted to build not only a great career, but also great lives. We wanted people that weren't afraid. And, and I say this in interviews, to this day and going back 20 plus years, we all screw up every day. And I use different colorful language rather than screw up. We all screw up every day, but we have to be capable of learning from our screw ups. We have to be capable of nurturing others to help them learn why they screwed up. And we can't be afraid to screw up. So we want people that are willing to get in the batter's box, people that are willing to be empowered to make decisions, to make actions, to impact decisions. A lot of people in our industry really want to be told what to do. They want to be told, go do A and here's how you do it. And then go do B and here's how you do it. And we want people that will challenge us because we know if they'll challenge us internally, they'll challenge the client. And we're not going to be successful if we just do what the client's doing 
over the years and maybe we can make it 5% better. At times we have to challenge ourselves and our clients to go in different directions and do things in a different way, especially with technology and social media. We can't do what we did last year or five or 10 years ago. So we need a culture where it's okay to challenge. We needed a culture where people want to embrace the opportunity to do things differently. Um, and then another big part of our culture, Rob, is being good partners. And being good partners means doing what you say you're gonna do, being honest, being trustworthy, not afraid to challenge, as, as I said. Um, those are really important tenets to our culture and, and they've served us well. You know, it's, it's one thing to, to have a startup, but it's another thing to have a startup with not only a friend or a colleague, um, but with a partner kind of feeding off each other's skills. How have you guys divided that up? Which one of you guys are the more linear thinker, the operations, and which one of, which one of you guys works in the business and the other one works on the business? Or how does it structure? Well, that's also a great question. There are actually four partners at Paragon, and we all have very distinct personalities and expertise. And, and really, the, the, the common denominator goes back to our culture. We're good people and we're good partners. And we, we all define success in a similar way, but we all get to success in a different way. And one of our partners is much more focused on the operation of our business and everything that goes along with that relative to IT and finance and HR and, and legal. And the other partners are more focused on bringing in business and, and nurturing business and bringing in people and, and growing people. Um, and, and we all have different types of industries relative to new businesses that we're going after. And we all do things differently relative to new business and managing clients. But one of the things we've done over the last 10 plus years is re we've really amalgamated and coalesced what our learnings are independently and shared that those collectively. So as we develop a new skill set or a new way of approaching an agency client dynamic, we share it amongst the company. So we all learn and grow from it. Oh, that's wonderful. You're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> We're having fun. We're yeah. Having fun. Well, so let's, let's talk about the industry. Let's talk about the side of the industry that um, Paragon is on. How much has it changed in the 23 years? Well, uh, I, I guess like all industries, most importantly, our industry has changed a lot. And it used to be in the consulting side of the industry when, when companies were, were buying big sponsorships, it was all about the big sign in left field. Yeah. And let's get, let's get the biggest sign in left field with the most TV visible exposure. Let's get some tickets, maybe a promotional right. And, and now the big sign in left field is almost like table stakes. Yeah, I, I know that if I want the right relationship, the right partnership, I'm gonna to have to accept that. It's not all about engagement. It's all about how do you create one-on-one -on -one engagement, community engagement, market engagement, and then how do you use emerging media, social media, et cetera, to drive that engagement, to sustain that engagement. Fans don't care about the big sign, sign left field. Fans have some or a huge amount of passion, and the challenge to brands is how do you fuel that passion? How do you enhance that passion leveraging a partnership? and a sign in left field isn't gonna do that. So that's the biggest evolution I think in our industry is, is going from what was really straight awareness and exposure to creating sustainable, meaningful engagement. You've seen the market sure. shift too, obviously um, you're in it every day, but what has changed from your perspective and how did you guys adjust with the digital media, the new media um, platforms that's coming in? Because obviously now there's, you know, uh, brands and leagues and teams and businesses want to see kind of um, qualifiable information and data. Um, but the old fashioned putting a product in someone's hand, you know, have you, I, I don't know if that will ever change, but have you guys seen that change or shift in, you know, where people are putting their money or brands? Well, Absolutely. Between digital and social and, and mobile and the desire for measurement, uh, there, there have been significant uh, monumental changes in how sponsorships are thought of, how they're activated, 
what assets the team can or can't deliver, what you have to go and secure from other entities outside of the team, um, what brands have internally as opposed to externally. So th there's a lot more layers in, in how you build really dynamic engagement now, working with teams and, and players and the representatives and leagues and rights holders. Um, and then measurement is also critical to the equation now. A, a, a lot of sponsorship used to be qualitative and we're getting closer and closer to being able to quantify much of what we do one way or another. And, and to answer your question, it used to be getting product in hand, but not, now it's, it's getting a one-on-one -on -one dynamic in place. How, how can we talk to you, whether we're talking to you traditionally or digital or social or mobile, how can we spark your love of whatever the game is, whether it's chess or boxing or bowling or ballet or, or theater, how do we give you more of what you love? And if we can do that, that's what we can measure. What have you found that the brands are pushing, not just you guys, but the industry to have sustainability after, after the event is over? So that, that connection with the consumer, um, the follow-up with the consumer, what do you see happening and how has that shifted in the last five years or so? Well, I, I'm going to answer your question may, maybe a little bit off question, but brands are starting to really get smart at storytelling. And a good story goes on forever. Mm -hmm. And people want to tell and hear and share a great story. So between brands internally and, and their agencies and at times their, their, their partners, the story goes on forever. And, and how do you tell pits, pieces of that story preseason, in season, postseason? That's that's the challenge. And, and that that's really the beauty of what we do now is is we're we're part of creating and distributing this, those stories. Awesome. Well, those are those are great questions that I want to ask you, but the, about the business, but so let's let's get back over um, to the operational side, and I know we got to wrap up here, but you know the difference now with with that the young professionals that are walking through your doors now than they were 21 years ago. People ask me this question a lot, and I don't see the same kind of I see the same kind of kid that comes through. They have the same kind of wants and needs. Obviously, how they communicate is a little bit differently. You know, I'm always arguing the fact that they're not lazier. They're not, they're just a little bit smarter. They're not as inclined to stay 20 years like their parents stayed at jobs. Um, what advice do you give those young career seekers that are coming through, which I'm sure you have a lot of part, big part of your 90 employees are probably the ones, you know, the, the ones that are young professionals coming through. What advice do you give them on their career journey? Well, I think you hit on something that, that I believe in also, and the entry level generation of employees, people, let's call them 21, 26 or so, intellectually, they are so far advanced from 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's very, very smart. Most people that we hire have had multiple internships and have, have an undergraduate and or a graduate degree in the sports business. So they're very, very capable. A lot of these people have high aspirations as well. And sometimes the challenge that we encounter is they're thinking about, well, what's it gonna take for me to advance to the next position, the next position after that? How do I reach director? How do I reach vice president? And the advice I give to people a lot when I talk to college students and, and grad students is the critical importance of being present being present, learn what you can learn from an opportunity, develop the skill sets that you need to develop from that opportunity, be successful. I can't tell you how many people have worried about what am I going to do in my next position when they haven't mastered the roles and responsibilities of, the, of their current position. Mm -hmm. So it, the good news is they're very ambitious, they're very capable. The challenge is that they aren't sinking into the right now they're very much concerned about the next step or the next few steps. It's, you know, it's one of the reasons where, where you know, when I took this, this part of my career now, um, working with college students at the University of New Haven, 
and then certainly our uh, the event we're putting on the Sports Biz um, Startup Weekend down in Orlando. Um, I feel like there is a, a a disconnect, and I think that you know discovery or where you fit in. Um, trying everything, it, although it might not be in your roadmap, you know, there's that squiggly line. There's no more of that straight line anymore of getting a pension. Um, and, you know, you have a generation of kids are, I think they're coming through now that want to be entrepreneurs that see startups happening. It's becoming part of the culture of, I can start a job for my, in a, in a business for my dorm room. Um, and obviously you're going to be a, a guest speaker down there at the sports biz startup weekend. Um, you know, do you find that the characteristics coming through now that students are a lot more, um, and the young professionals are a lot more entrepreneurial. Um, and I don't even know if I pronounced that right. It kind of sounded like it came out wrong, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, do, do, do you find that they have a little bit more, they're more intrigued by how the business actually runs well there's they're intrigued and they're enamored but sometimes they're intrigued and enamored with with the wrong things mm. and being an entrepreneur means that you are going to work your ass off yeah. and and you are going to at times work 16 18 20 hours a week being an entrepreneur means you're going to sacrifice some things you may not be able to go to that party on a friday or saturday night you may not be able to get rid of your seven year old car that was a hand me down from your big brother that you know doesn't start on cold winter nights in Chicago. And, and whether you're an entrepreneur or just a new employee, I, I think that this generation of up and comers doesn't realize the investment you need to make. Again, whether you're an entrepreneur or an employee doesn't need uh, understand the investment you need to make to be successful. You know, there's an old joke, and I and I don't recall it exactly, but it takes about 10 years to become an overnight sensation. Mm -hmm. And you know, whether that's you know as an employee or whether that's an entrepreneur, you've got to put in a lot of time before you start to see the benefits. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, I always love at these these commercials and these you know people start fascinating about being an entrepreneur sitting on a beach with a laptop i'm like i don't know don have you ever done that before <laughs> yeah, twice yeah. twice i was like you know it's like when you're on vacation and and you have to take the call and you're in line at you know space mountain at disney world and your wife's looking at you you're like well you know the reason why we get to do this is because i have to take this call <laughs> right? it, it, literally it, january 4th uh, my, my wife and daughters and I were in Puerto Rico on the beach and the phone rings and it's a client and I answer immediately and immediately I get the stink eye from my wife. <laughs> right. But um, that's, that's what being invested, that's what being a good partner is, is you're available. And the good news is my client was calling me because he, he had a buddy who's a senior vice president of another company who needed agency support immediately and would you talk to him today? Like, uh, okay. Good thing those, are the those are the best. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the pina coladas tasted great that night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tone, you're the best. I appreciate it. Listen, you know, it is a sports biz podcast. Um, this is the interview with influencers and, and I've, I've admired you from afar in sports business journal. And you've always been a guy that, that I've really admired in the industry and just a class act and, and a pure gentleman. And um, I look forward to seeing you down in Orlando in January. So thank you. for well, your th time. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Oh, absolutely. Sports Biz Podcast, Tony and Rob here. See you later, everybody. Thanks for joining.